I think it's uh, very helpful to know where we stand. Um, let's uh, now uh, try to uh, start our first class. Uh, okay, so um, I'm gonna uh, first, uh, like I said, this is gonna be uh, what we call an introduction or preliminaries. Uh, very likely some of you have seen this. Uh, if you haven't seen, uh, then maybe obviously it's time to uh, uh, study uh, these ideas. Now, uh, first, very easy, the notation. So I'm gonna start with some notation. Uh, the natural numbers are uh, for us, do not include zeros, is one, two, and so on. All right, so uh, uh, sometimes people include the zero, uh, we will not include. Uh, it's just a convention, nothing really uh, deep going on. Now, uh, next we have uh, integer numbers, which are uh, zero, uh, one, uh, negative one, two, uh, negative two, and so on. So what happens is we have both uh, positive and negative. Uh, next, we have uh, rational numbers. Uh, which are uh, ratios of integers. Uh, so P and Q are integers. So I should probably say that this is what I call integers. And um, obviously Q is non-zero. Now I should probably also say one more thing uh, and I just happen to remember now. So uh, we are here for uh, supposedly two hours uh, shall I say, uh, 50 and 50 minutes. Uh, I'm going to try, I know uh, this could be sometimes a long time, but I'm going to try to go without a break. Uh, I'm assuming that uh, if you really need to step away from the computer, um, you'll do that anyway. So uh, in other words, if you need a, a short break uh, while I'm presenting, you'll do that anyway. You don't need to let me know about that, right? So um, I'm going to go with... Uh, going without a break, which means I'm finishing a little bit earlier. So if we start at 10, I'm uh, expected to finish around 11.40, right? So just so that we are not confused about, um, that's the plan um, in terms of how we run the online class. Again, uh, if you need to step away, uh, that will not be a big deal. Uh, I hope uh, you can uh, catch up uh, with uh, what I'm saying. Okay, so now uh, rational numbers, uh, it's actually a very interesting uh, story here because if you go back uh, and, well, if you look at the history of numbers, um, rationals in a sense uh, has a connotation here, right? So if you say about somebody, his, uh, uh, his logic is rational, that means is a good logic. On the other hand, if you say irrational, uh, that means it's not a good logic. Now, the irrational numbers, uh, again, if you go back in history, they haven't been accepted um, for quite some time by the Greeks. I'm going back almost 2,000 years. To, uh, 2000 years. Uh, this is why I think that a nice project is uh, to see how you actually define in a rigorous way the real numbers. So in other words, uh, from rationals to uh, real numbers, um, you are actually uh, supposed to do this uh, step uh, in a very in a careful way, obviously, if you care about, or you can just say, well, you just add some irrational numbers. Uh, that's what most people do nowadays, I believe. But you can also do it in a very careful way. And this is one nice project uh, one can consider, right? It's how you define the real numbers as a completion, we say, of the rationals. All right, so this will be the set of real numbers. And we have also the complex numbers. So once you have a real numbers, it's not very difficult to define the complex numbers. I say just say is a plus i times b, where a and b are real numbers. So the key point here is how do you actually define the real numbers? So I'm hoping that uh, uh, at least somebody, or maybe more than one person, uh, thinks about this project. Um, there are at least two different constructions I'm aware of. So one is uh, using uh, Cauchy sequences. Uh, there are other ways of doing it, but probably this is the most, well, uh, if you think about this class, uh, probably will be most in line with what we do in this class using Cauchy sequences, which I'm, I'm gonna define uh, maybe later to the next class. Now, uh, facts which are gonna be very useful, especially for the first assignments, 
and this tells you why uh, static uh, constructions of the real numbers will be nice. Is the first one is that Q is what we call dense inside the real numbers. And I'm gonna explain this uh, later today. And if you look at uh, what we call the irrationals, uh, these are also dense inside the real numbers. So uh, this density, uh, like I said, I'm gonna explain it, um, is actually a very interesting property. And so I'm hoping that uh, some people consider this as a project. Now, uh, continuing on, um, so if I have a, a set X, so let's say it's a fixed set, um, and if I have a subset A, then I can define, and uh, here the notation may vary uh, for the complement. Uh, the one I'm using, which is the one the textbook that I follow uses, is the following, so C of A, I know sometimes this could be confusing because C could stand for another set. Um, so it's a C of A. Uh, this is really the X uh, minus A. So these are all the elements. So let's say uh, little X inside of X, which do not belong to A. Right, so uh, what this means, it means that uh, uh, this is what we call the complement. of A relative to X. Uh, as a, an example, uh, so if you uh, think about, uh, let's say uh, my X is uh, the interval AB, which could be, let's say uh, zero to 10. And uh, if I call, uh, let, let's say A is the following set, uh, let's say this is C and D, so this would be my A. Then the complement, maybe I can use some coloring. This would be the complement. Right, so uh, complement is going to be given by AC union with, uh, oh, I guess, uh, I have closed, right? Because uh, I, I remove uh, an open set and then uh, DB. All right, so uh, I think you have seen this uh, concept before. I'm just obviously uh, reminding you that the complement of a set with respect to another one is all the elements which uh, lie outside of the given set. Now, uh, there's an observation Uh, we have that, for instance, uh, if you look at A uh, minus B, in other words, the elements, of, uh, elements in A which do not sit in B, that's the same thing as A intersected with the complement of B. Right? So it's very easy to check this. Also, if you take the complement of the complement, that's going to be back to A. And uh, very important in some arguments is that A inside of B uh, that's equivalent to the complement of B being instead of complement of A. Right, so um, very uh, useful sometimes as you're about to see uh, later when you talk about uh, uh, open sets and closed sets, for instance, uh, this becomes very useful. And we have uh, famously uh, the De Morgan law Uh, which states that, uh, for instance, if you take the complement of an arbitrary union of uh, sets, A sub alpha are some uh, sets, um, then uh, this complement uh, interactive uh, union has intersection of the complement of A alpha. All right, so in case uh, some of you uh, are a little bit confused, I'll just say that the complement, let's say, of A union with B, 
that will be the intersection of the complement of A with the complement of B. And you can actually uh, exp generalize this to arbitrary unions. Again, these are very useful. Uh, you may probably have seen this in a class like Logic 201 or some 200, I should say. Uh, they will become very useful, as you are about to see. Now, um, a second, uh, the Morgan law that I uh, want to review is the complement. So we said what happens if you have an arbitrary union. Uh, now let's look at arbitrary intersection of um, A sub alpha. And maybe uh, this will be a good time to ask. Uh, so remember, uh, if you do uh, answer this, uh, they will become bonus. Uh, do you happen to know or do you remember uh, what happens to the complement of the intersection of uh, arbitrary, well, uh, have an intersection of uh, sets A sub alpha, nothing special about A sub alpha. Uh, use the chat uh, if you wanna answer. Okay, so, uh, turns into union, that's correct. So that's uh, indeed correct. So uh, uh, I, uh, I agree uh, that will be a good answer. So this is gonna be a union of the complements of A of alpha. So uh, uh, it's almost, uh, I would say uh, close to obvious, but now uh, I think it's time to also think about the proofs um, now, the reason I'm doing the proof is uh, to actually give you an idea how do you go about checking, right? So sometimes you may need this type of statement, but you are not sure about it. And then uh, the next thing you do is uh, you are going to try to prove it. Uh, once you have a proof, and obviously everything should be fine. Okay, so how do you prove? So um, I'm going to show uh, one of the two. The other one uh, I uh, suggest, I advise you work it by yourself. This way you uh, indeed uh, check that everything uh, makes sense. So you have, uh, you want to, you want to show that the complement of the union of A alpha is the intersection of the complement of A alpha. And notice that this is a really a arbitrary union. Now it's, uh, I'm not assuming anything special about how many sets and nothing special, spe special about the sets either. Key in this uh, proof is that I'm looking at uh, equality, if you want, between sets. So then uh, first I'm gonna show this inclusion. So when you wanna show that two sets are the same, uh, you are gonna show that one set sits inside the other and vice versa. Okay, so then what we do is we uh, let X be in the complement of the arbitrary union of A alpha. Then uh, what happens is, uh, my X um, now everything happens in a big uh, set X, right? So this is going to be inside of a big X set, uh, a big uh, set X, and obviously X cannot belong to A alpha or any alpha, right? Because uh, being in the complement of the union, that means it cannot be in any of the sets in the union. But that in particular means that X belongs to the complement of A alpha or any alpha. Uh, which in particular means that X belongs to the intersection of the complement of A alpha. Right, so let, uh, let me recap. So what is that I wanna do? I wanna take an X, which is in the complement of the arbitrary union. Uh, that means X belongs to the big space X, but uh, not in any of the A alphas. But that in particular means X is in the complement of A alpha or any alpha. So then it should be in the intersection. So that shows the inclusion. Now, uh, next we are gonna show the other way which is, as you probably can guess, now I'm expecting most of you to say, well, now everything is easy and fine. So what you do is say, uh, let X be in the, in the intersection of the complement of A alpha. 
But then uh, what this means means X belongs to the complement of A alpha or any alpha. Uh, I'm gonna use this uh, symbol actually um, in case you haven't seen. So this stands for N. And then uh, what this means, it means that X does not belong to A alpha or any alpha, which means X does not belong to the arbitrary union of A alpha. And that means X belongs to the complement of the union of A alpha. So we are done. Okay, so a uh, thing to remember here is that if you have to show equality between sets, the best way to proceed is you show one of them is inside the other and vice versa. Okay, so now uh, before we move on, more properties. Which uh, are about sets. And if you wanna check, if you wanna prove them, uh, they go uh, the same way, inclusion in one and inclusion in the other. So for instance, one such property is that if you have intersections of uh, A alpha, then obviously this is gonna be uh, inside of uh, A sub beta. So what do I mean by that? So here I have an intersection of A alpha. Obviously, uh, okay, maybe what I'm gonna do is I'll show it by an example, and this is gonna be inside a union of A alpha. And this is gonna happen for any beta. So what do I mean? For instance, if you have A1 intersect with A2, then obviously that's gonna be inside of A1 and that's gonna be inside of A1 union of A2. However, I can also have equality. All right, so there are, and that this should be obvious, right? So the intersection is always in any of the members and each of the members is in the arbitrary union. So what I'm saying is uh, sometimes because of the notation may look complicated, but uh, if you actually pay attention, it's very easy. Next, uh, I have intersection of uh, A sub alpha I, where I is in some index set. Um, this is gonna be inside of, uh, well, I think, I, I, think I, I'm, I meant to say something else here. So A union with uh, intersection of A alpha. Okay, so again, this is something that uh, you need to check. So this is very much like, uh, uh, addition and, uh, and uh, products. So this is gonna be the same as the intersection of A union with A alpha, right? So what happens here is that you can take it inside, you say, right? So you have A union with A alphas and then the intersection comes out. Now, I strongly advise that you look at uh, uh, this and uh, you try to prove it. So maybe a special case will be sufficient. So for instance, you can say A, a union with A1 intersect with A2. That's the same thing as intersection of, well, you have A union with A1 intersect with A union of A2. All right, so this will be a special case of the form. Okay, uh, next. Uh, I have A intersect with uh, arbitrary union. Uh, again, uh, as probably expected, uh, this is gonna be the union of A intersect with A alpha. And again, I advise uh, at least check a special case. So for instance, A intersect with A1 union with A2, that will be um, A intersect with A1 union A intersect with A2. And again, how do you check it? You show uh, inclusion in one way and the other. Okay, so next uh, I wanna talk about the Cartesian uh, product and eventually get into what we call relations and then um, uh, equivalence relations. So that will be one important item uh, I wanna describe. So like I said, uh, let me uh, start with a definition. So if we have uh, A and B, objects. Now, when I say object, uh, I really mean something which could be very abstract. For instance, some of you have taken probably group theory, 
uh, it could be group, groups, for instance, right? So uh, this is why I'm using this terminology objects. Uh, they could be very, very uh, uh, abstract objects. Oh, well, I say objects, but uh, abstract uh, uh, concepts. Then we define uh, a pair uh, to be uh, what we actually call an order pair. So that means uh, A, B uh, versus B, A, this will be different, right? So the order matters. We have a property that um, A, B equals, uh, say, A prime, B prime. So now, it's, uh, now I want to know when two order pairs are equal, if and only if. And uh, this is something that I'm going to use uh, uh, because it happens to be very common in our discussion. So IFF means if and only if. Uh, we have at A equals A prime and B equals B prime. All right, so uh, the two order pairs are equal. Uh, something that you probably have seen, if you have taken complex analysis, right? So two complex numbers are equal if their corresponding real part is the same and complex part is, uh, and the imaginary part is the same, sorry. Okay, so now I think I can define the Cartesian product. Uh, of uh, sets uh, A and B. Um, to be all the order pairs. So you have A comma B order pair such that A is in A and B is in B. All right, so the Cartesian product is really, uh, you put together um, order pairs of uh, elements of objects uh, from A and B. Uh, as an example, If I say A is, uh, let's say, uh, one, uh, 1 and 2, and the B is uh, A, B, C, then um, the Cartesian product in this particular case is going to be pairs of the form I have 1A, 1B, 1C, then 2A, 2B, and 2C. Uh, as a special case, uh, as, as also an example, so if you take R cross R, uh, that's going to be R squared. So now it's, uh, if you take the Cartesian product of two lines of real numbers, you get uh, uh, the what is called Euclidean plane. Now definition, uh, which is uh, a concept that I was really uh, uh, looking for, is the concept of a relation. So we say a relation. Uh, between uh, uh, sets A and B uh, is a subset. And uh, I uh, want to stress, so it's uh, really just a subset, uh, which I'm going to call it R of the Cartesian product. And here is uh, an example. So I can take um, uh, of a relation. So a relation is provided, for instance, by the following subsets. I have one A, one B, and one C. Right. So I only select some of the pairs that appear in my Cartesian product. Um, note that um, empty set is a subset of any uh, set. So in particular, it's going to be a subset of the Cartesian product. So that will be a relation. Uh, and the Cartesian product itself. So if you look at all the pairs, uh, that will be another relation. So these are called trivial relations. 
meaning that uh, obviously uh, we always have them. So no matter what sets A and B you start with, you always have these two particular extremes if you want. Um, as a, a notation, if you have uh, A sub A and B a pair, uh, which belongs to a relation, or the, you have a relation, which means the subset of the, uh, of the Cartesian product, then uh, you also say A, R, B. All right, so this is just a convenience um, for us to use. Now we come to something which is very important. So a definition, we want to define what is called an equivalence relation. So a relation, call it R, which means a subset of the Cartesian product, uh, which is inside of A cross A. Right, so I want you to pay attention. I'm obviously about to ask a question. So a relation uh, is called um, an equivalence relation So this is what I'm trying to define um, on A if uh, the following properties are uh, satisfied. So first we say is reflexive, meaning that uh, A is in relation with A for any A. Second property is uh, what we call symmetry. meaning that if A is in a relation with B, then B is in a relation with A. And finally, is transit, meaning that if A is in a relation with B, B is in a relation with C, then A is in a relation with C. Now, uh, here's uh, uh, one uh, question I ask. Uh, can we talk about an equivalence relation on any two sets A and B? In other words, uh, if I have A and B, uh, I do A cross B. Uh, can I talk about an equivalence relation there? So I wanted to pay attention here. So what happens is obviously I cannot do that. So it's very important here that I'm talking about A cross A. So that's correct. It cannot be defined. So what happens is uh, um, if B is a different set from A, uh, then um, for instance, I can pick an element which is in, well, maybe I should ask as a follow-up. Uh, okay, so which of the three conditions will uh, clearly not be satisfied and why? So you have uh, three conditions that, so let's say you attempt, let's say you are naive and say, okay, I have A and B two sets. I take my relation inside of A cross B. Um, why, uh, which of the conditions will clearly uh, may not be satisfied? Okay, so uh, what I'm uh, aiming for is you notice that, uh, let's say you have A and B are different sets. That means there is an element in A, which is not in B. Then uh, uh, the reflexivity may not be, uh, may not occur, right? Because uh, you need to have A in relation with A, but if A is never in B, uh, this is never gonna happen. Uh, somebody is mentioning two. Uh, yeah, that is true. Well, except, uh, you have to be a little bit careful about it because two in a certain sense uh, never happens, right? Because here, uh, here's what symmetric means. It means if maybe uh, in my part, I should, if I have a relation between A and B, then there is a relation between B and A. But, um, um, well, uh, if you think about, well, yeah, I see what the point is that, uh, um, if B is not in A, so maybe I should take it back. So maybe uh, uh, when somebody mentioned number two that fails, maybe that maybe that is acceptable because uh, what he's essentially saying is the same thing, which is I have an element in B, which is not in A. Uh, however, I have a relation between A and B. 
but then I cannot reverse it because B is never in A. So I agree, I take that as a good answer. Thank you. Yeah. So I'll keep track of these answers. Um, um, and like I said, they will turn out to bonuses in depending on what you actually need. Okay, so uh, keep in mind that uh, a relation, uh, if you want an equivalence relation, then you really insist on, uh, on the set A. Now you wanna go from A to A. Now a proposition. Uh, so let's say we have uh, R be an equivalence relation on A. meaning that is a subset of the Cartesian product of A with A, then uh, we can say the following. Uh, first property is that if I have a relation uh, A and B, uh, this is if and only if uh, the class of A is the same as a class of B. Okay, so now I have to explain what I mean by this. So where uh, A is all the elements, let's say C, such that uh, C is in relation with A. Uh, if you have uh, seen, and I hope you have, uh, uh, for instance, uh, when you talk about cosets for groups, uh, this is like the coset, right? So um, you look at A, uh, if you have an equivalence relation, then you look at all the elements which are equivalent to that, which A, that will be the coset of A. And now what we are saying is that if A and B are equivalent, then the two cosets which uh, initially contain A and B, in fact, have to be the same. Uh, next statement is almost obvious. So A always belongs to the equivalence class of A. And uh, finally, if I have these two classes, this uh, class of A and class of B, which I know are not disjoint, or the intersection is not empty, then I have that the two are equal. Okay, so I'm gonna actually prove, uh, it's not very difficult So prove. Uh, for the first one, uh, obviously if it's an if and only if, so this is really uh, one reason we wanna pay attention on the proof is because I want to, uh, want to remind you what it means if and only if. It means uh, two directions, right? So if A is in relation with B, uh, then uh, I want to show that the classes uh, of the elements which are equivalent to A, which form the class of A, is the same as the elements of which are equivalent to B, which means the class of B. Then let C inside of class of A. Right. So again, uh, pay attention. We have to show uh, two sets are equal. Then uh, we want to know if C belongs to B, the class of B. Right. So that's what we want to know. But now uh, what is it I'm gonna do? I'm gonna say, well, uh, A is in a relation with B. C being in the class of A means what? It means that C is in a relation with A. And now I'm using the transitivity to conclude that uh, uh, C is in a relation with B. So uh, this shows that indeed C belongs to the class of B. Now, uh, likely most of you see uh, the argument for the other inclusion. All right, so if I say let now C, or let's say call it D inside of the class of B. All right, so what this shows here is that the class of A is the subset of the class of B. Now let's do the other inclusion. So have D is in B. Uh, that means what? It means that um, uh, D is in a relation with B. But now uh, A is in a relation with B. In particular, it means B is in a relation of A, right? So this implies D is in a relation with B, B is in a relation with A. So then I can conclude again by transitivity that D is in a relation with A, which shows that D belongs to the class of A. So all in all, uh, this shows that the class of B is a subset of the class of A. And finally, what we wanted is that these two classes are the same. Okay, so, um, Again, uh, we see this uh, uh, technique where we say that uh, having these two classes the same uh, is really saying that uh, you show inclusion in one way, one direction, and inclusion in the other direction. 
Now, uh, are we done? Uh, no, because this is an if and only if. So I only show one direction. Now I need to show the other direction, right? So um, converse, conversely, so if uh, the class of A equals the class of B, uh, then uh, I want to show that uh, A is in a relation with B. Well, uh, I think it goes, uh, I'm going to actually uh, show this first by showing two. So uh, to actually prove a converse, I'm going to use the two. I'm not saying that this is the only way, probably there is another way as well. But I'm going to say that A uh, does belong to the class of A because A is in a relation with A. Right, so in particular, this means that um, uh, now I have A is in the class of B, right? Because A is in class of A, which is the same as class of B. So that implies that A is in a relation with B. So we have done. So in fact, uh, we also showed part two, right? So uh, this shows the number two. And we now can conclude that indeed A is in B. So that means A is in relation with B. So now I have uh, the other implication, right? So keep in mind that if it's an if and only if, you have to show both directions. Okay, so now finally, uh, number three, uh, what we wanna show is that uh, it's like for cosets, like I said, if you are familiar with the group theory, for instance, or you have seen any equivalence relations, then you know that uh, the orbit or words, the elements which are equivalent to a given element A versus, uh, so we want to show that if I have this element which are equivalent with A uh, and have a non-empty non intersection with the elements which are equivalent with B, then uh, the two classes are the same. We say that the two cosets if they are disjoint, they are the same. So for two cosets, we say that either they are disjoint or they are equal. Okay, so how do we prove that? So let C in their intersection. Then uh, obviously uh, what we can say is that uh, uh, C is in a relation with A, right? Because C belongs to the class of A. And uh, C is in a relation with B, right? Because uh, it's gonna be in the class of B. But then again, using the transitivity, this will show that uh, A is in a relation with B. So they are equivalent. But then uh, now I can make use of first part, right? So if A is in relation with B, then their classes are the same. Okay, so equivalence uh, uh, plays an important role, uh, as you can imagine. Uh, now, uh, before I uh, uh, say more, uh, let me also remind you that uh, as a special case for a relation, we have a function. So example. Um, a function uh, is an example of a relation. Now, uh, we have to pay attention, it's not quite an equivalence relation yet because uh, your sets might be different. However, uh, there are cases where a function can become an equivalence relation when you have what is called a bijection. Okay, so uh, uh, let me just say that, uh, how do I see that? So if I have F from A to B, in fact, uh, the way you define a, a function is that is a relation with a special condition, which is to any element in the domain, you assign at most one element in the codomain, right? So that will be the formal definition of, of a function. So this will be a function. Then uh, you declare that A is in a relation with B, now you have this uh, pair of an element coming from the domain and the codomain if f of a equals b. Now, as a terminology, you may see it, uh, probably have seen it already. Uh, if you look at all functions, uh, say uh, f going from a to b, and I stress it's about all possible functions. Now, as you look at all possible 
relation with this additional condition that uh, I said earlier for the definition of the function. This is denoted uh, with uh, a to the p, so it's uh, sometimes called the power set. So look at the all, so this will be all functions from a to b. Now, a very important is that uh, not any relation is given by a function. Right, so I think I stress a little bit that the definition of a function is indeed is a relation, but with ex extra condition. So note, uh, not any relation is going to give us a function. So for instance, if you remember the example, I think I mentioned uh, um, of a relation is the one A, one B and one C. Uh, this is a relation, but uh, not a function. So I'm wondering if somebody can tell us, uh, use the chat please, uh, why is it that this relation, which is a subset of the Cartesian product, I think I mentioned earlier, uh, this is a relation, but not a function. So what fails here? Uh, in other words, why is it that we do not get a function? It should, shouldn't be very difficult. So I'm hoping that you'll agree that this is a relation, right? Because it's a subset of the Cartesian product as we talked about. But now uh, the question is why this relation cannot be, uh, cannot define a function, right? So this uh, sits inside the, so my A, I think was one, two, if I remember this properly. And my B was A, B and C, right? So, um, clearly is a subset of the Cartesian product, but it cannot be a function. Okay, so I think uh, the reason is uh, uh, to one, we associate in the target space two, uh, three values, right? So that would be like a, a multi-valued function. So because to one, we assign Um, more than one value. Correct, we assign uh, A, B and C, which obviously will seem to be distinct. Okay, so now uh, finally, we, now we move on to something which really uh, is play, gonna play an important role when we talk about uh, Lebesgue uh, measure, which is countable sets. So if you want everything here was uh, hopefully you have seen before, and now we are uh, focusing on countable sets. So for instance, if you uh, happen to uh, think about doing uh, completion of the rationals to get the real numbers, countable sets is an important concept. The rationals turned out to be countable, uh, which I'm actually gonna show to you, uh, not today, maybe uh, next class as opposed to the real numbers, which are uncountable. So definition, uh, two sets are going to be a called equivalent. So I'm gonna define what it means for two sets to be equivalent. In terms of notation, I'm gonna use uh, this notation. So A uh, equivalent is B, if uh, there exists. So now I'm gonna use this symbol if you haven't seen it, so this really exists. Um, what we call a bijection. Uh, mapping or a, ma a function. Uh, F, which goes from A to B. Um, now, uh, I probably should remind you in case you haven't seen, so bijective uh, means the following. So recall, by a bijection, 
I mean, uh, obviously, injective, injective and subjective. So uh, if I'm to think about injective or uh, maybe you are familiar with one-to-one -one, is the same thing. Uh, and also this is called uh, an onto, so maybe I should uh, say that. So one-to-one -one, and this is onto. Okay, so injective usually means that uh, there are uh, many uh, ways of defining, I should probably say that too. So if you have f of uh, x1 equals f of x2, uh, when, uh, then uh, it has to be that x1 equals x2. So every time f of x1 equals f of x2, then x1 equals x2. And then uh, subjective or onto is that for any uh, y inside of the target space B, there exists x in the domain such that f of x equals y. All right, so uh, in other words, uh, we say that the range covers the entire target space. Okay, so if I have a bijection between two sets, when I say that the two sets are equivalent, so uh, going back to uh, uh, relations, uh, yes, you can allow yourself to have a relation between two different sets and uh, try to talk about an equivalence relation, provided that the two sets are in a bijection. So then you use a certain identification. So yes, you can do that. But uh, if the two sets are not in a bijection, uh, then uh, uh, obviously uh, you may have a problem in terms of defining an equivalence relation in that case. Okay, so now observation is that um, a is equivalent with A. So in this case, the bijection is gonna be just the identity. Uh, hopefully you all agree with that, uh, right? So now what I'm trying to show is that uh, this uh, definition that I made here indeed is an equivalence relation in the sense we just mentioned. Uh, now, if I have uh, A equivalent with B, which means I have a bijection between A and B, uh, then uh, I claim that uh, B is equivalent with A and likely you can see uh, what is the bijection. So maybe somebody can help me. So what will be the bijection I'm using for an I'm showing that uh, this indeed is uh, 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 re uh, re reflexive. I meant to say uh, symmetric. I know that I'm not saying this right. So it's symmetric, right? So what is the bijection that I'm gonna use? So if I have a, the inverse of F, that's correct, thank you. And now finally, if I have A is in a bijection with B, say using F, and now B is in a bijection with C using G, then uh, I can now use the transitivity relation to show that A is indeed in a bijection with C. And I suppose uh, you can use a composition, right, of F and G. All right, so do G compose with that. And uh, we probably should all remember that if I have two bijections, then uh, the composite is still a bijection. Okay, so uh, now uh, that I have this concept of equivalence between sets, I can uh, uh, define uh, first what I mean by uh, a finite set. So note, uh, if uh, my set A is empty or uh, my set is, let's say, uh, one, uh, two, up to n. Then uh, we say A is a finite set. Okay, so uh, these are my uh, model sets for a finite set. Anything uh, which is in a bijection with uh, this type of set will be called for a noun uh, a countable set. Uh, I'm gonna also include the natural numbers. So definition, if A is a finite set or equivalent to a finite set, or uh, equivalent to the natural numbers, then A is called a countable set. Uh, 
Okay, so uh, we all obviously assume that the finite sets can be counted from now on, and any set which is in a bijection to a finite set will be, count will be from now on countable. But also we have uh, natural numbers, these are countable, and anything which is in a bijection or equivalent to, uh, to this set. Now, uh, note, uh, if A is not countable, Uh, then uh, we say that A is uncountable. Uh, I'm not gonna get into the ordinals, uh, Aleph zero, Aleph one, and so on. Uh, that is also something that if you like set theory, uh, that direction you can actually uh, try a project in that direction where you can talk about various uh, uh, ordinals. In other words, uh, the cardinal of a set is infinite, but you can distinguish, right? So Aleph zero will be countable, Aleph one will be uh, continuum and so on. So there are very interesting uh, um, things that you can say about it. Uh, so if you are interested in uh, say set theory, uh, that would be a nice project. Now proposition, uh, assume that I have A1, uh, A2 uh, and so on, AN, uh, is a countable number of uh, countable sets. Okay, so uh, uh, let's uh, 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 let's stop for a second. So what am I saying? Is I have uh, um, a finite or infinite, but if I if it's, if it's infinite, then I can actually count, which means I can use the natural numbers to count them. So these are sort of the number of sets. And each set is supposed to be countable itself in the sense I just mentioned. Then the union A1 with A2 with uh, AN and so on, it's still countable. So what happens here is that uh, you basically start from your countable set and you do uh, what we call countable operations. So you uh, take union in a countable uh, manner, then you do not get out of the class. You are still in a countable uh, setting. Okay, so this is a statement. Uh, this is a proposition which we are about to prove. So this is probably uh, the first proof which requires a little bit more attention. Uh, it turns out it's not very difficult. Uh, most of the time, if you ask people, uh, they will say, well, this is, sounds like an obvious statement. The uh, funny thing is that uh, if you ask, ask uh, how to actually prove it, uh, it's uh, sometimes annoying. It uh, uh, looks a little bit difficult for whatever reason, right? So I think it's probably a good thing to uh, look at uh, how you actually go about proving. So what we are gonna do is the following. Uh, we are gonna assume that these uh, sets which I start with uh, are disjoint, right? So I'm gonna uh, say assume that uh, uh, A1, A2, and so on, are what is called mutually disjoint. Now, uh, this is very annoying to start with, right? So how can I make such an assumption? Some people say, well, uh, I'm not really sure I see that. Once you do this assumption, it turns out everything looks much easier. So uh, indeed, how do we do that? So let me, uh, so this is again, this is like one of those tools. If you haven't seen it before, uh, it's good to have it. How do you uh, change uh, a certain uh, union into a, into a disjoint, mutually disjoint union? So you are gonna do the following. So otherwise, so your union of AIs, which is what you are uh, obviously given, you are gonna write it like this. You are gonna say is A1, so the first set is the first set, but now instead of A2, I'm gonna write A2 minus A1. Now notice that for the purpose of the union, I'm not losing anything, right? So what I'm doing is I'm uh, uh, removing from A2 whatever was common with A1. Then the next step is I'm gonna say A3 
and maybe you should try to think about, so what you're gonna do is, uh, well, in the first instance, you may say, I'm gonna remove A3, but maybe you should remove A1 and A2, right? Because you don't wanna share anything with A1 either. And I hope uh, you kind of see where this is going. So uh, let's say we get to the stage N. So that means I'm gonna union with A N. Now I'm gonna remove, uh, Again, I'm gonna give you a chance to think about it for yourself. Uh, so it's gonna be A1 union with A2 union with AN minus one. And this keeps going. It's a countable union. Now as I'm uh, having uh, countable steps, so that means uh, 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 this is doable. Now uh, there is no contradiction, logical contradiction. And now what is it I achieve? Well, uh, I achieve the following. So if I call this, a2 now, let's say prime. This is A3 prime. And so on, this will be A n prime. Then I get a, a union, but now all of them are what we call mutually uh, disjoint, right? So this is gonna be equal to the union of A i prime and A i prime intersect with A j prime is gonna be empty as long as i is not the same with j. So this is actually a very useful technique, right? So you have an arbitrary union of sets. You can always, by making this replacement, say that you have an, a, a union of mutually disjoint sets. Okay, so uh, why is that useful? Uh, now I'm going back to my uh, statement. So I'm gonna say that, uh, uh, I'm now uh, trying to prove uh, that, uh, oops, I, I'm, I'm here, I'm trying to prove that this union is still countable. So uh, we have union of A n and A i intersect with A j is now empty if i is not the same with j. Well, we have a following uh, uh, way of doing it. So we say, all uh, right, uh, each, and I want to stress, it's about each set A, A sub N as uh, I have A N one, A N two, and so on. It is countable, so I can describe it with these elements. And what is very important is that uh, there is no repetition, right? So if I look at, uh, let's say I take uh, A sub one, uh, that will be A one one, A one two, and so on. And uh, they are disjoint. Uh, this is something that I am uh, already assuming. And now we have a, a nice construction, which is very easy to uh, show it in terms of a, a picture. Uh, so you are gonna arrange. So the first row is gonna be A11, A12, A13, and so on. So this is really what we call the A1. Then the second row is gonna be A21, a22, A23, that will be for A2. And this uh, keeps going. So let's say I'm uh, AN1, AN2. And that will be standing for A sub N. Now, everything we see here is the union of A Ns. And I wanna see if I can count the union. Uh, like I said, it's important that now they are disjoint, so I'm not really uh, re repeating anything. Uh, and indeed you can do that. So what we do is uh, we, we can find a process to count. So first we count, so a process to count. So we start with A11, then um, maybe I can highlight this. So we start here. Then uh, we uh, move from A1 to across. So then it's gonna be A1, two, A2, one. Then uh, we move from A1, three to A2, two, two, and then A3, one. and so on. So the idea is that now I can generate a process which will do the counting. In other words, I can find a bijection 
between my union and the uh, natural number. So this will be my first ten. This will be my second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and so on. So now I can provide a, a bijection. Okay, so uh, this is going to give rise to a bijection from the arbitrary union of a n's into the natural numbers. All right, so that means indeed this arbitrary, well, I should say countable union, not necessarily arbitrary, arbitrary would be a, a probably a wrong. I'm saying a, a countable union of countable sets is countable. All right, so um, it is important. So maybe, uh, maybe I should ask uh, the question why, and this would be actually a, a, an important question. So why is it that uh, I wanted this to be disjoint. So let's say uh, my sets uh, are not disjoint. Now, as I have a repetition of terms, uh, what will be uh, the problem with that? Uh, this will show that you do understand. So what will fail? In other words, uh, uh, why, uh, why do we want to make the sets uh, A1, A2, AN to be disjoint? What will be the problem is say, I have a repetition. Very good. The function will fail to be bijective, right? So you have to uh, realize that uh, a bijection means you obviously go back and forth with, from n to the your union, but now you are going to have a repetition. So that means uh, you're not your function may fail to be, uh, um, for instance, injective going from the natural numbers back. So yeah, that's exactly right. Very good. Okay, so now uh, you may say, well, uh, what's a big deal? I'm obviously uh, looking at the uh, uh, clock, so I'm not, I'm probably having about five minutes. Uh, we do have a, a nice application of this proposition and that is uh, the following, Q is countable. So uh, in fact, the hard work has been done in what we just proved. Now we basically uh, take advantage of that, so the proof is saying that, well, uh, let's try to describe the Q as a countable union of countable sets. So I'm gonna say let A sub N be the following. So I'm looking at all the uh, fractional numbers with a denominator N. Obviously N cannot be uh, zero. If you ask about zero, uh, then you can always uh, take p to be zero. So p is an integer, all right? So you can let p to be zero. Now, um, clearly, a sub n is countable. Now I say that, uh, but uh, let me just uh, add. So n is, if you fix your n, uh, then uh, you basically allow yourself p to be from the integer set uh, numbers, but then z itself is countable. Uh, it's not very difficult to see that Z is countable. Yeah, it is a bijection from uh, Z to N. So now we have this A, N is countable. Uh, now, uh, clearly Q is a union of A sub N. Right, so N uh, goes um, from one to infinity. Uh, now, uh, probably I should say that uh, a sub n's as it is, they are not disjoint, right? But that's not really an issue anymore because the previous proposition wasn't insisting on that. Uh, we were actually doing as a step, right? So remember my proposition wasn't asking for disjoint, but we were able to reduce to disjoint. So that means uh, this is an accountable union of countable sets. So we deduce from here that Q is countable. Okay, so uh, we have uh, obviously uh, showed a very nice uh, uh, statement in the end, which is Q is countable. Obviously you probably have uh, known about it, but now I think we have a, a, a good argument for it. Now, uh, before I end, uh, maybe I should uh, say that an assignment will come out uh, maybe later today. 
um, maybe a very useful uh, idea for the assignment, at least some of the questions will use what I'm about to say next, uh, so real numbers. I think I mentioned that now I'm gonna be more, uh, more uh, uh, formal and I'm gonna say exactly what I meant. So I, I mentioned that Q is dense in the side of the real numbers, meaning the following that um, um, say uh, for any R, which is a real number, uh, there exists an epsilon um, okay so uh, uh, okay just a second I, uh, I don't like the way I started so q is dense in R means the following so if q is in q then uh, for any um, epsilon greater than zero there exists Oh my goodness, uh, which way do I want it? No, I think the way I studied was correct. So I'm also trying to, okay, so I will try again. So for any R inside of R and for any epsilon greater than zero, there exists Q inside of Q such that, uh, R minus Q in absolute value is less than epsilon. Okay, so what is it I'm trying to say? Uh, maybe it's easier on a picture. Uh, so I claim that Q is dense in R, right? So if I pick any real number, say this is R, and if I pick any epsilon, so that means a very small interval around it. So this would be R minus epsilon, R plus epsilon then no matter how small epsilon is, I can always find a Q, a rational number, which is within de uh, epsilon, de uh, epsilon distance from R, right? So that means a density, in other words, you can approximate. So in particular, any rational number is a limit of rationalness. Now that's what this means. Okay, so uh, uh, the same can go, uh, so similarly, R minus Q, so this will be the irrationals is dense in R. Meaning that for any real number, so this is very similar, and for any epsilon, right? So no matter how close I want to get, there exists a number, let's give it a name. So let's call it this X, which is uh, uh, irrational, such that the distance, which in this case will be uh, between x, well, r and x, is less than epsilon. All right. So if you think about pi, for instance, um, no matter how small I pick my interval around pi, so this will be pi minus epsilon, pi plus epsilon, I can always find um, Well, I think I, again, I, I obviously that if, if pi is irrational, then obviously uh, I can, I just pick a rational, irrational number. But uh, I think the idea is that if I pick a rational number, so let's say it's, uh, I pick number one, then no matter how small I have an interval around it, I can always find an irrational. So this will be the irrational number, uh, which is within this dis uh, distance epsilon from one. Okay, so uh, I'm obviously uh, running out of time. so. Um, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop here for today. Uh, I'll stick around for a couple of minutes if you want to ask me questions. Uh, if not, uh, thank you for your patience for today's class. And I hope to see you back uh, next class, which is on Friday, same time, 10 o'clock. Okay, so I'm uh, stopping here for today.
So let me know if you have if you are waiting to ask questions. 